Listen, can we talk about AI quickly? Yes, of course you can. Yeah, I just put the word quickly on there so you don't say no, but obviously it's going to be another three hours. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, <laughs> how did you make the jump from maths to AI? What is it about AI that's, that got you hooked? So I don't think they're that far apart, if I'm honest. Um, I think that once you have, um, if you exist in the world of maths, and you're describing the world in mathematical ways, mm. if you are creating mathematical models, you're inevitably creating algorithms. And while I know that the whole world is slightly obsessed about the distinction between artificial intelligence and non-learning algorithms, actually, I see that line as much more blurred. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, in every situation, what you're doing is you are transcribing the real world um, into a language that can be manipulated with mathematics. And so ultimately, you know, I, 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 I think it's a natural progression, a natural progression from mathematical models into artificial intelligence rather than this, this, this jump. I think my, my latest thinking on artificial intelligence is that where there's a problem that we cannot describe to a computer, we we have now invented this way where the computer can teach itself in its own way. So that's, for me, that's my understanding of AI. I have no idea how to describe to you a cyclist in this image, or, or rather what cyclists in general look like. So we've mm. now got these genetic and neural networks that can kind of work it out for themselves, but in a, in a way that we don't even have to understand, a bit like our, our own brains, I suppose. Would that be yeah. about right? Yeah, I think that's fair. The, yeah. the example I always give is that um, if you've got a smart light bulb that's connected to the internet and uh, you can set it so that it turns itself on at 6 o'clock and it turns itself on at, off at 11 o'clock, dims itself at 8 p.m. for you to do your reading and so on, that's an algorithm. Mm. But if your light bulb uh, picks up on your habits every day and uh, you know, uh, notices that you turn the light, but that you turn the dimmer switch on at eight o'clock, and notices that you go to bed at eleven p.m. Then that's artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that uh, certainly behind the scenes there is a distinction there in the in the process that you're using. But I think that uh, in many ways, as the user, um, I mean, do you care? I'm not sure. No, but I know. It like you say, it still comes down to an algorithm. It's, I suppose it's just a yeah. difference on whether we, the humans, wrote the algorithm or whether we wrote the meta-algorithm yeah. and then the computer yeah, kind right. of wrote, you know, came up with the numbers itself. Build in the gaps. Yeah. yeah. Do you think there's a way of telling what the most advanced AI is at the moment? Does that Ooh. question even mean anything? Ooh. I know you've done some stuff with DeepMind and, and AlphaZero and uh, yeah. all of those you know, it's, it, the AlphaZero family seems to be right up there. But it, it, is it a question, do you think, that's, that, that's, that means anything, the most advanced AI that's around? Um, most advanced. OK, I think so you have to be careful about your definitions. Um, so I think if most advanced, given, you know, the definition that you've just given about um, artificial intelligence, which, by the way, actually is not universally agreed on. Right. So there are especially a lot of the old school um, AI researchers, they would say that anything where um, a, an artificial, uh, uh, where uh, a decision is being made artificially, that counts, right? They would say this is this whole big broader thing where, you know, just so, so my light bulb, for example, mm. um, that you program in, they would say that that is a version of artificial intelligence. So this, this learning distinction actually, I okay. think is, um, uh, anyway, whatever, a separate yeah, point. For the record, I don't uh, find that, but there you go. <laughs> yeah, I know me neither. Um, okay, all right. So you have to be a bit careful about what you mean by most advanced. So given this idea that learning is the thing that matters, you could say that perhaps the most advanced AI is one where we have taught it the least, where we've instructed it the right. least of all. Yeah. Um, and so I think if that is the case, then uh, I think Alpha Zero isn't just up there. I think for me, it's probably yeah. uh, peaking ahead, um, you know, the fact that once you the thing I like the most about that Alpha Zero story is that um, because there were previous versions where, for example, with chess, right, previous versions where you let it look at loads of chess games that humans have played mm -hmm. and you allow it to learn on that basis yeah. to look through those versions of chess. Um, what I like about this is that once you take those versions of chess 
away, once you take away the human instruction, the machine does much better. Yeah. So they, they took the two versions, one where it's been trained with the guiding human hand and one without, and they let them play each other. And the humans had made the thing way worse, right? <laughs> without without any humans, it was infinitely superior. Yeah, it we found ways better. that we hadn't Absolutely even thought about superior. doing it, you know, taking it right back to basics. Yeah. So Alpha Zero, um, and they're now making one that plays a different video. Is it Star StarCraft or something? The, uh, yeah, Starcraft. Yeah, yeah which yeah, is obviously which is far more, more difficult. Yeah, I mean, you have to think that when you're playing chess, you have a complete view of the board. Likewise, Go with Starcraft, you're only ever your um, just your your um, your periphery, and yeah. that's it. Really, you don't have a full understanding of the game at yeah. all points. And so, the point with um, DeepMind and, and Demis um, is that he he wanted to make an AI that could play a game because you, a game is something where you can describe all the rules within the world. So as long as you can feed all that yeah. in, you know, you can set your AI yeah. off. Do you think there are people right now who are trying to describe our actual world using rules for the reason that therefore they might be able to get an AI that wins planet Earth? <laughs> or, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, there definitely are. I think they're called agent-based modelers. <laughs> Oh, right. Um, um, I'm going to um, be slightly uh, careful in how I say this, but um, there was a group uh, a few years ago, maybe a decade ago, who essentially tried to do exactly that. Right. They were like, well, OK, complexity is a very exciting field, you know, big patterns that emerge from small scale behavior. Maybe we can just create an agent-based model of the entire world, right? Mm. And we can put in how many people go to church and we can put in what people like to do on a Sunday. And then we can have all of these dots moving around and each one will represent a person. And the whole world will be deterministic mm. before our eyes. Yeah. It's just, you can't do it. Have you seen <laughs> you Devs, by the way? I have started it last night. Oh, please. Started it last night, oh, yeah. Uh, if only you'd, but we, we binged it a couple of weekends ago. If you'd done that, then we could have discussed that today. But um, I mean, I do know I do know the entire premise, unfortunately, because I uh, was um, a shame. You know, Adam Rutherford is the scientific advisor on it. You sorry, say say that again. Adam Rutherford, was my co-host on Radio Four, was he a scientific, scientific advisor? advisor? He's very good friends with. Yeah, yeah. No way. Oh my goodness. Very anyway, good with Alex, we won't talk about simulation theory because we've both got to have dinner at some point. Um, listen, it's <laughs> just a couple more things that I had down here. Right. So on the subject of general artificial intelligence, I met this this guy called Chaitan Doob a few years ago who works. Ooh. He owns a company, I think, called IPsoft based in New York. Um, and he was making a chatbot called Amelia which was very good. It, it impressed me, with, and they showed me the working of how it would tear apart uh, natural language and kind of add facts to its knowledge base um, and sort of engage mm -hmm. in a conversation that was kind of more intelligent than <laughs> you know, some call centre agents that it was going to replace. Um, and he, I think he, it's either me to him or him to me, posited the idea that that's a very specialist AI, that, you, that couldn't yeah. do something else. But if you made a lot of different specialist AIs, you know, one that could interpret images, one that could, you know, control a, a, a body, one that could have a conversation, one that understood, you know, various things, and you kind of chained them all together under a big kind of umbrella, is that a different way of making a, a, a general AI? So you're not trying to make one piece of software that understands the world, but you are calling in whoever you need, whichever you need to do the thing that you're doing. Is that, is that madness? No, I don't think it's madness at all. And actually, I think that's kind of a realistic, um, a realistic thing to uh, have as an ambition. Um, because I think that, you know, we have to be honest with ourselves, right? We are already at a stage where for a great deal of tasks, we have machines that have already achieved superhuman abilities. And I think that to have this um, to have this uh, extra criteria of like no 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 it has to be the same one <laughs> like that can do all of this stuff um, is just uh, well I mean it's a tiny bit unfair really isn't it <laughs> like the goal the goalpost is moving a little. I think I personally think there is a lot of arrogance in well computers wouldn't be able to do it because as well as humans and that's already as you say being proved wrong in even in self driving cars you know that we we know that mm. they're they're better, or they 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 have unusual accidents and whatever. But do do you think we're being too arrogant? I've seen lovely oil paintings done by AI that I would buy 
over some works by humans. And I've listened to AI music and it's, it's pretty nice, thank you yeah. very much. So I, I, I wonder whether there's any... Does it move you, though? Um, I'm, I don't claim to be to know anything about art or music or anything like that. I just know a good tune, right? And I know mm -hmm. something that, that pleases me visually. And so, yes, I mm -hmm. would say that it's perfectly possible for a good AI. I mean, Robbie Barrett is someone on Twitter who churns out AI paintings all the time. I would have one of those on my wall and I mm. would not know the motivation of the person who created it. I mean, everyone. So on the program that we're doing, I'm upstaged by the painting and the rainbow cushions every week. Right. That's most comments I get are <laughs> who did the painting? And I love your cushions. It's a great painting, but I have absolutely no idea what the person who painted that was thinking so I'm moved simply by how how joyous it it makes my eyes feel and I think yeah. why would a computer not be able to do that you know there are plenty of bots on Twitter that that just generate you know noisemaker is one of them that I really like they, they make nice pictures so you can call me uncultured if you like but I no, I no, wonder I won't. whether I won't call you uncultured. plenty of people would because that's that's often the argument, you know, is it is there any emotion conveyed there? And I doubt whether a lot of people understand the complete message that an artist was trying to get across in their work anyway. It's, it's what it means to the person who's consuming it. And so at that point, yeah. it doesn't matter whether it's a computer that's learned how to paint or whether it's a human that's learned how to paint. So I had I had a big debate with them um, with. Uh, researcher, uh, professor, um, what's he a professor of? Uh, a professor who studies a lot of artificial intelligence in music a number of years ago. And um, I was essentially saying, but it does matter. It does matter that there's a person on the other end of it. And his argument was if you take a song like Happy, right, by Pharrell, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Pharrell, he sings Happy. Yeah. Um, and his argument was Happy, happy, I'm so happy. Uh, because I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy. And he was like, come on, are you telling me seriously that a machine wasn't, wouldn't be capable of coming up with those kinds of genius lyrics, yeah. right? Or are you seriously telling me that, you know, when you get something like, um, I don't know, One Direction or uh, a boy band or, um, you know, whatever, that's like yeah. uh, a sort of manufactured pop group, um, what is the difference between a room full of people churning out whatever kind of stuff that they know the audience will lap up and a machine doing the same thing? Like, is there really any difference? And I do accept that. And I think that there are some situations in which actually artificially generated art, music and, 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 and paintings and so on really don't matter. I think, you know, if you're in the, the lobby of a, of a hotel room and you need something nice mm. to go on the wall just to stop it being a blank wall, then I think, that's, I think that's fine. And I think, you know, if you want some music to play in the elevator or whatever, I think that's absolutely fine. Um, but I do also think that um, inevitably as humans, actually, we use art and music and paintings and so on as a form of connection between us and the and the artist and I think that unless you have lived a life unless you understand what it's like to I don't know I don't know like be scared about coronavirus or whether you understand what it's like to have your heart broken or like really understand what you know what are the like the cliches right like what it mm. feels like to stand in the rain like that kind of stuff um to be really hungry or whatever like i think that it that that you'll never quite have that connection and maybe if you don't know that it's artificially generated you can imagine it yourself but i kind of do think that it still matters i think i think that art is much more about having nice things that we decorate our our our, our space with and much more about forging connections between humans. Okay, okay. I'm also very uncultured, by the way. Well, I'm also very uncultured. You know, so. I, it's interesting <laughs> because I, I, I do, and this is, I've just remembered, it's me interviewing you, and I, I went off on one there. Um, no, <laughs> but, I liked it. But, um, no, I do stand on the other side than you. Um, I, so I, I went to the Isle of Wight a few years ago um, to see uh, an exhibition of just some arts, and the artist was there, and it was really weird abstract art and there's a big face and there were lots of words written around it like this you know maybe scrawled in anger the artist was there so I thought brilliant this I actually I've never really met an artist to discuss their work so I asked what you know, what why did you choose those words what was it what was your inspiration what was going through your your head um and she said I oh, know it's just just some words I made up at the time and a little piece of me died 
because at that point I thought. But that's that's the point, right? That's the point. The... A little piece. It doesn't matter what she meant when she was doing it. It was that you had a story in your mind about what it might be. But so and, so and... that's it. If 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 a computer generated that and I didn't know it was a computer, I would still have that story. And it's so maybe yes, it's the knowledge that yeah. the computer. Yeah. But you see where I come from, I think that, the, the, you know, the, the, the complex um, AI systems that we, we have and that we're going to make are themselves beautiful. And the fact that they will be trained on. You can't tell me that most artists and most musicians aren't inspired by other musicians. So in the same way, a computer is inspired by possibly many, many more artists and, and musicians sure. because you know they, they have that and so yeah they, they might not the computer might not have been having a bad day on the day it did the thing and hadn't had the experience of walking in the rain but maybe it's I, I just don't think it 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 well sorry yeah it's, fine it's me okay, interviewing okay you, I agree that the artists are inspired by other artists sure I agree with that but at the same time that if you are basing what's good only on what is good that has come before it, then you allow no room for originality. If you're just turning the kaleidoscope of everything that's that's already existed, nothing will ever come out that is that really floors you. You know that that's no Harry Potter's. That's uh, that's no uh, yeah. Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> Great may not examples there. Be a bad thing. But, but <laughs> computers, but no Picasso, computers right? are no so capable of originality too. I mean, you the AI algorithms, in my opinion, yeah, but original original is not the issue. Originality is not the issue. What's what's what do you mean? It's easy to do. It's easy to be original. Yeah. It's 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 being good and original. Yeah, that's hard. You know, and I think I personally think, you know, I don't I don't think we should discount computers as you know, they can be original and they can be good. And they, occasionally they'll hit on something that's original but and good. How do you know, though? What do you mean? How, how do, do you know? know? How do you know what? Well, that it's original or that it's good. How do you no, no, knowing whether it's original is, is easy. Um, it's both creating it and knowing it's original is easy. Uh, and separately knowing it's good is easy. Yeah. But how do you know if it's churning out loads and loads of stuff, how do you know which what the good ones are? It takes a human to spot it, right? Oh, and yeah, then but we're that's the no consumers. longer AI. We're, we're the consumers. So, you know, the AI is churning out and maybe it's learning over time and it learns by somehow we've got um, a reader farm. We've got humans in pods being fed through their necks and they all they have to do is read the infinite monkey cages <laughs> outputs. Um, and over time, it will learn what's good. And that's that's absolutely fine. But it, it's original because we've never read something before. And it's good because we, the humans, enjoy it. I don't think we should we should disallow computers from producing something that's original and good. No, I'm not saying they should disallow them either. I think, all, but the thing, okay, so let's say you've got your people in the pod and then yeah. a Picasso, like that new, new Picasso, yeah. new, a Picasso like painting comes through. And if that human is like, nah, rubbish. I mean, they're pretty sure the first person to see Picasso was like, what is that? Yeah. Uh, it's, only because you had one individual who was like tracing, tracing that blail, <laughs> blazing that trail. That's the only reason why we got him. Yeah. <laughs> We're not going to persuade each other, no. are we? <laughs> Can I ask you one, one more question <laughs> before yeah, go we go on to chat too? Right. Um, AI again. If we um, get to a stage where we can create an AI which is at least as complicated as our brains in some, mm. by some definition, um, and so we're starting to see an AI that, that can take in the world and react to the world and learn about the world in general, would it be fair to say that that AI might develop something that we might have to end up calling emotions? Uh, and just to say my, my, my belief is personal belief is that emotions are this kind of higher level a, 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 a biological feedback loop that is now in a, a higher level species so we've given a name to the thing yeah. that makes us want to do that thing again or never do that thing again or stay away from that person we've given that names but do you think that that's going to be inevitable at some point if if ai gets us that complex yeah i think that's a really great question because the thing is is that i mean there are people in different camps of this there are people who say absolutely no 
it will always be cold and calculated and, and logical and unemotional. And there are other people who say, well, okay, if you uh, if you think that, uh, for instance, AI can never develop emotions, then you're saying that there's something magical about our our, our own hardware. There's some there's some spark of something that exists that just isn't isn't able to be replicated, and that feels like a really weird idea. And I probably am actually in that camp because I mean there's some very persuasive stuff about the idea of free will. Um, free will feels like a very human thing, right? You can't. I mean, you how can you possibly code that in, right? Okay, so there's some there's a couple of really nice studies which suggest that actually free will or the illusion of free will perhaps. Uh, and randomness being retrospectively explained actually is uh, an important thing evolutionarily, if that's a word. So if you think, for instance, you've got, um, say you've got a fish. Um, now, the fish, the fish, certain fish, uh, when you try and attack them, if you try and tickle them on the side, tickle them on their stomachs, they will automatically bend themselves into a C shape. And it happens every single time. It doesn't matter, doesn't matter what situation you put them in. You just you try and take them on something, they bend into the shape. So the problem with that is that because they are incredibly predictable, um, there are other animals that have been able to exploit that. So there's a particular type of snake that uh, bends itself around to pretend that it's going to tickle the fish, but really it's waiting on the other side with an open jaw so that when the fish bends, it bends into its jaw. It gets it every single time. Um, now, there are other animals like cockroaches, for instance, which have a similar reaction. So if you go to touch them, they feel the pressure of the air and then they dart off. But rather than dart off in exactly the same direction, they dart off randomly. They dart off in different directions at different times, um, which suggests that, you know, actually randomness. And I don't think anyone would suggest that like a cockroach perhaps, you know, is like is choosing, is like making the decision of which direction to go in. Um, but then you take like fruit flies, for instance, you take a fruit fly and you put it inside a drum, a white drum. So it's a sensory deprivation, essentially, for a fruit, fruit fly. And uh, you monitor which direction it's flying in. So it's, it's held stationary, but it can kind of like move around like this. And the path that it takes demonstrates that it's almost making some kind of a choice, right? It's not just moving around completely randomly. It's not just dirting, darting around randomly. It has no outside stimulus, but the path that it takes, it's as though it's making some kind of mm. choice in that matter. So I think that there is evidence that, you know, even things like fruit flies, uh, they look like they are, they're not just perfectly random. They are making decisions um, making decisions, if you like, in the most rudimentary form of decision making mm -hmm. and ex demonstrating some form of free will. And I think that, you know, if uh, there's no reason why I, I, I kind of think that in a way you're like wrapping up how we feel as humans, calling it free will, when in reality, actually, it's something that's kind of much more um, much more innate it's like an evolutionary advantage to us. Yeah. So I kind of think I buy your argument, right, that like, actually, there may just be uh, it may just feel like we have emotions. It may just feel like we feel happy, we feel mm. sad, all of those things. But it's the language that we put on it to explain what is ultimately just a computation. I don't know. I mean, it's interesting stuff, but I don't know. <laughs> thank you. Listen, thank you. I really appreciate the time. This has been fascinating. Stay safe and, and stay well. Thank you. And you.